All right, everybody. We want to have a discussion this afternoon on this evening, looking at holding high expectations for black students. And this comes from, um, this comes out of the idea first of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. So if you know, if you know, we're going to talk about that later on some more, but I know a lot of you have already done that because it's one of the hottest, biggest topic out there. If you understand the, the, the tenets of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy, you will realize that the number one tenant, the number one thing about culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy is holding high expectations. That's it. Because remember, culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy is about em student empowerment. It's about making our students stronger. It's about making sure your content is relevant. And if it's relevant and responsive, the students can identify them, see themselves in what you do, then we are guaranteeing that we are gonna see success. So the first one is we need to hold high expectations. And I did this one as a second lecture because I want you to realize we started out looking at deficit thinking. Well, you know, deficit thinking is prevalent in so many spaces, not just in our school. Deficit thinking is prevalent in many of your college and university classrooms. Many of your professors, they are professors who have deficit thinking about who you are. As a person who have done workshops for years and qualified, I have walked into spaces where you can sense there's a deficit about who I am because I am not their usual guest speaker. I am not their usual keynote. When we look about authority and knowledge and way, we go to the dominant space. We go to the Eurocentric space. So anything that is different is less. I guarantee you, if I'd gone to some big conference this afternoon and I was dressed like this, just my head wrap would be distracting from some people. Not because it's beautiful for them, because it's fabulous. Not because they're interested in it, but because somehow they now have seen a side of me. Now they're seeing me, me bringing in my African heritage, my ancestral retention, and it disrupts what they consider to be valuable because I should have turned up in a suit and a tie, beautiful pocket piece and a dangerous brooch. If you know me, you know me, I always come dressed like that. But sometimes you have to know how to disrupt what people think it's supposed to look like. So it's important we think about holding high expectation. So I have on my slide at the cover, you see what's going on at the cover. I'm sure many of you follow the story. Uh, of 24 black medical students to get into University of Toronto Med School. I'm sure you follow the story. There was a long discussion years ago when they realized one black student was in the medical class, one. And people would ask themselves, well, why are the black students? And if we, if we follow the idea of meritocracy, then we'll say, well, they don't, they, they, if they worked hard, they would have been there. No, when you do that kind of narrative, what you do, you forget and you, 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 you do not acknowledge that because of systematic racism, systematic bias, institutional bias, that's why many of our students are not selected. So then they did something systematically. They did something, they disrupt. This is what I call a disruption. You see, for many people, a disruption looks like a riot. A disruption looks like a march. A disruption looks like blocking the gate and burning down the building. This for me is a disruption. This is a disruption. It's saying we can make space and we can be intentional in how we recruit black students, in how we recruit racialized students, in how we recruit students that are considered high risk and inner city and all the language we're using and urban because we have to be intentional. I told you before, I said to the librarians at my conference with them the other day, I was talking about black excellence and I said to them, I remind them, black excellence was always there. You just didn't feature it. Black excellence was always there. You just didn't feature it. And I know somebody may say, wow, then why so many students got in? Did they lower the acceptance bar? No, they did not. That is the issue. When you say that, 
you are also lacking the idea that we need to hold high expectation for our black students. How do you do that? Because I know some of you may be saying, Adi, you must be saying, Dr. Campbell, I hope you know that for black students, they have already pushed us harder. We already worked twice as hard just to get the same recognition. We know that, but that's not what this is about. You're gonna see what, what this is gonna be about. It's not about you overworking and trying to be there. It's about institutions and spaces like classrooms, like my classroom. I am also a part of a system. I am a part of the oppressive system. I am a professor in the system. It's about how do we make sure we hold high expectations, get ready now, and we support that high expectation. So write that down for me. The Odin high expectation is one thing. We are talking about how we support that high expectations. How do we support black students and racialized students? So I use black students as our center in discussion, but I hope you know you can plug in other racialized bodies there. You can plug in students who are LGBTQ plus. You can produce pl plugged in other are minoritized or what we call when people call equity seeking group or as i call equity deserving groups so how do we do the interruption so even when our black youth are directly in 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 in, in deficit thinking space in our institution they are still living under the pressure to overcompensate be better at anything get better grades So we have to be careful as we think about how will you work at interrupting and disrupting the flow. So what we want to do as we have this conversation, we want to literally talk about examine the persistence, low expectation and deficit mentality prevalent for black students. It's there. It's there. We know about that. We talked about that last week. We want to discuss the impact on black students identity and sense of belonging. And there's a quote that I don't have beside me, but I'm gonna find it. I am going to find it because it's so important. And, and, and it was given to, it was shared with us by Kiki Ojo Thompson. She talked about, I'm gonna find it for you in a minute. And she talked about the fact that when you as students go through all of this, what happens afterwards is they question their self-worth. When we, when we, when we underestimate and undermine our students, then we go back and we question their, their, their tensions of their self-worth. Come on now, we have to think about it. When you undermine someone so much, how will you, how do you expect them to also present themselves with self-worth? We have to acknowledge the barriers faced by black youth within our system and institutions. We have to examine the tools to ensure black youth success. I want you to take a look at that. What tools do you have? Make a note of that question. What tools do you have in your toolbox as an educator to ensure black youth success? Are you coming from that equity lens? Are your practices inclusive? Last, last week we talked about strength-based approach. If I ask every single teacher in this room, every single student in this room, name me one of your strength-based approach. Will you have to go run searching for it? Or it's right there, right there on, the, on your lips. Illuminate the possibilities and strategies that will focus on students' strength. Strengths. Many of our students are sitting in the back of the class. They are affected by the deficit thinking. They already checked out. We have many of our students who have checked out. So I usually do this activity. I want you to do this activity by yourself. Many of you maybe not will do it good because you are you are self identify as black. But I guess, but I think you will do a great job at it as well because you know what assumptions people hold about you. So I want you to do me a favor. As I'm talking, I want you to do this on a piece of paper by yourself. The assignment talks about assumptions, stereotypes, and biases. In the, in, in the circle there, I don't want you to put black students only. You can put black students, but I want you to put a category of student that you know is mar uh, marginalized. You could put Asian students there. 
You could put new immigrants there. You could put hijab wearing girls there. You could put black girls alone there. You could put black high school boys there. You could put um, you could put um, students who identify as black LGBTQ or LGBTQ. You could separate us and put transgender youth there. You could put students with mental health issues and concern there. I want you to put a category in the middle. We're not gonna share it, you know. You're not gonna share it with me. It's your confidential work, but I want you to actually write it as we are speaking. Do it. And I want you to be honest about this activity. Think of one group of people. So you have already thought about that. You put that in the middle there. And I want you to do me a favor. In each box, what, write what you have personally constructed about this type of person, or what are some of the assumptions that you have heard about this type of person? I remember that as you're writing, I remember as a child growing up, I knew I was different and I understood quite early um, that I was different and that I was maybe, I was gay. I, I didn't learn that word. I learn, I learn a more derogatory word in Jamaica. So it's, it's, isn't it sad that at an early age, I want you to grab this, at an early age, the, the description for who I was as a child who was gay wasn't a good word. We didn't have, I didn't have the word gay at that time. We had some, some really offensive, dirty words. So imagine you are learning about your identity and it's, and it's filled with the assumptions and every single thing is negative. So if I put gay, black, gay boy in the middle or black, gay, immigrant boy in the middle, I am putting some dirty words. I am putting demon possessed on my outside. I'm putting nasty. I am putting, will grow up to be a pedophile. I am putting, I am putting sexual um, um, disease. I am putting um, HIV. I'm putting all the negative things that I heard that were the assumption, the preconceived notions. Have you done that? As you're writing, I want us to take a minute to reflect. As you're writing, I want you to type for me in the box, how are you feeling as you're doing this activity? Every single person, as you're doing this activity, type for me in the box, how are you feeling as you're doing this activity? Go ahead, I'm waiting. Just start for me, a word or a phrase. How are you feeling doing this activity as you're doing this? Let me see what we have there in the box. You can read some of that. I won't read names. Self-aware, unconscious, upset, sad, ashamed. Many levels to that. Encouraged, self-aware, ashamed, affirmed, ashamed, anger, anger, self-aware, ashamed, emotional. It is. It is emotional. I feel gross about how I think. Thank you for that, everybody. Thank you. But I want you to understand. So here comes the crooks of the matter, Vivian. Here comes the crooks of the matter. I want you to think about an educator who is having those assumptions about any child. How are they going to operate with that child? You think if I think you are about to fail, I'm going to be, quote unquote, wasting my time on teaching you new stuff? Because I think you're already a failure. You get me, Vivian? I'm already looking at you as you are incapable. So my expectations for you are low. <laughs> as a matter of fact, my expectations for you are actually nil. I am waiting for you to just finish and just allow this course to run its course so you can go. Because I have absolutely no expectations of you. Because I have it here. When we when, when I asked a question the other day, I said, I asked a question, this is what I asked. I said, name one impact on youth when we do not hold high expectation. Here are the answers I got. They assume they are incapable, self-image destroyed, insecure, low self-esteem, low achievement, self-harm, the self-fulfilling prophecy, disengaging our schools, resentful of the teachers and the system, lack of trust. I want you to understand that. This was what I, I did and, 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 and the response I got. I want you to understand these are factual response and these are from educators, by the way. So 
I like to look at what the youth are saying to us. People like to look at what adults are saying. I like to look at what the students are saying. And this comes from a, a, a document. You have this document in your reading as well. It's from the youth Rex. So go ahead and look at it. You can, you can click on it in, in, in your reading. It's from the youth Rex. And they asked the students, they brought the students' voices I, I there in the room and they say to them, what are you, what are those things that you are, cons how is a system responsible? How, tell me what is it that you, 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 uh, is, you're affected by? And I want you to notice something. This was done in 2000 and they were 17. I want you to understand. And that is why I get a little bit upset. I get very upset, I should say. Let me, I don't know what I'm talking about a little bit, but very upset when I go to educators or caregivers and we pretend as if we are so unaware what's going on with our students. If you, I don't know if you notice the number of persons who be very unaware about anti-Asian racism. I, it, it almost pissed me off and I'm putting that for the record when last month you were hearing all of this and people, people are behaving as if it was new. I have had students at OISE who are Asian students who have gotten close to talk to me about their research and talk to me about feeling lonely and talk to me about racism and cry in my office. This is not new. I'm talking about masters, at students who are doing their master's degree and tell how they feel even in the building, even in our OISE building. So when we pretend as if our students are not speaking to us, and communicate with us. We are being dishonest. And I'm gonna come back to you with another one because it's gonna surprise you. So this is what the student says. They said widespread anti-black racism. They named it. Black excellence not recognized. These are not Andrew Campbell's work, you know. This is from a document which I've given you a copy of. I want you to understand this is a youth Rex document, a research conducted thousands of youth, youths. So when I use this, I am very strong with my, with my workshop because I want them to get it, that it's not new. Do not pretend it's new. Number three, lack of black representation and leadership roles. They do not get to see black in excellence and how it operates. So how do you allow them to dream when they don't know how to dream and where to dream to? How will they do that? Somebody said to me, I am their first black professor and the person is living and you are living years going to high school, elementary school, college, undergrad and now a master's degree. Are we serious? Anti-black racism in our educational system, anti-black racism in the child welfare system, anti-black racism in the criminal justice system, trauma of racialized policing, Poverty and economic barriers, mental health and well-being of black youth. And I guarantee you, if we take the same questionnaire to the LGBTQ, not black, just LGBT community, we'll get some of the same response. So although we are focusing using black youth as our focus, I hope you realize I keep on asking you to replace black youth as well with other, other groups of students. I love this. I love this. I love this quote from Donovan Livingston, Harvard 2016 graduation. It's a powerful poem, a powerful poem. Google it. It's an amazing, powerful. He says an injustice is telling them they are stars without acknowledging night that surrounds them. I want you to think about that for a minute. I need every one of you to pause. I put it there for a reason. Remember what our topic is. Our topic is high expectation. This is a sun. This is a star. This is, this is where we want them to reach. But how dare we, us do that without acknowledging the night around them? We have to acknowledge the nights within our schools. I want to begin by asking about that. The denial of what is happening. These are night. How are you working to shine the light? So breaking down deficit thinking, holding high expectations. 
I love this quote by Professor John Portelli of OISE. He says, we need to be aware of the nature of the deficit mentality, its perversiveness, pervasiveness, and its dangers. This mentality relies on assumption that are indubitable educational values, norms, and qualities that are normal. Take a note of that. And universally acceptable by all. Anything that either diverts from or challenges such thinking is considered to be lacking in quality and ends a deficit. Let me just say this to you. Right now, I'm sure many of you have done course or you hear about courses talking about decolonizing education. Those courses are still getting pushed back, you know. People will still go to a course how to decolonize education, but they walk away thinking, is this possible? Can we do this? Is it the same value? Will it work the same? Because we are so wired. We are so wired to think anything that either diverts from or challenges such thinking is considered to be lacking in quality and ends a deficit. And this is precisely the kind of mentality that underwrites diverse form of racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia. Last week, I showed you this. In our first lecture, I showed you this. How do we move to strength base? So let's get into it. So we're gonna look at seven actions as we, thought, as we think about holding high expectations. And I want you to take a picture of this for me, everybody. Because when you go to your discussion, I want you to focus on these actions. How do we act as educators? How do we act as future leaders and present leaders? Because some of you are doing amazing work. How do we act? The first one is about the self-examination. We have to start there. We have to start a self-examination. Who are you, Vivian? Who are you, Kai? Who are you, Stephen? Who are you, Alyssa? Who are you, Elaine and Harmony and Carmen? Who are you, Ruby, Erin, Vanessa? Who are you? I want you to take responsibility and ask yourself, Shalina, who am I as an educator? Who am I? Where am I in my cultural competency growth? Where am I in my growth? Do I respect others? Do I see difference? When, when anti-black racism inter, 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 intersects with different form of, um, of um, um, identities, we have seen issues where we have said, yeah, black lives matter until it's a black trans life. Yeah, black lives matter until it's a black immigrant life. Where are you on your cultural competency growth? Are you that teacher, that educator, who can, you can walk away knowing you are growing in cultural competency. Or you're stuck in cultural destructiveness. How will you set high expectation? If I ask you that, if I was doing a two hour lecture, when I do a two hour workshop, I ask the participants to share with me, how will you set high expectations? I am open when, I, when we go to our breakout room and I look through and scan your posts later on tonight and tomorrow or whenever you post it, because you don't have to rush. We have a week to do that post. I want you to take your time. But what I don't want is last minute posts. I'm watching you, you know. You all, those who know me, Alyssa is laughing because Alyssa know me quite well. People know me well. If you post on a Sunday night, I'm coming to get you. If you wait until Sunday night, 11 p.m., I am coming to find you, Shalina. Shalina, I am coming to find you. That sounds like a threat, right? We have to erase that part of the video. Sound like I'm threatening you, Shalina. You understand? You know I love you all. So I want you to set an expectation. I'm going to surprise you with a story. I'm going to stop and I'm going to, I'm going to surprise you with a story. Years ago, I started, when I started to teach at the University of West Indies online, I teach online for years, the University of West Indies. And I was in, and I did orientation, a big group of students, over a hundred, sometimes I had 200 students in my course. I was the course coordinator. So we had a, had a you know, professors working with me. And I got this idea, Shalina. One day I got this idea in my orientation. The first slide was not welcome to 
like welcome to um, the course was called um, 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 is that welcome to EDLM, welcome to EDLM 1001 or welcome to EDLM 3002 or 3000. It wasn't that. My first slide, Shalina, it came to me out of the blues one day. My first slide was, this is university now, don't forget, this is university bachelor's degree in education program. This is first year student. They are having me in, in maybe their first semester or the second semester. My first slide was a graduation hat. First slide. I didn't even say good morning. I didn't even say good afternoon. My first slide when they met me was a graduation hat, the first slide. I've been doing that for, from 2000, and, I think it's 2011. My first slide. I didn't even realize what I was doing. Let me be honest. I didn't even realize what I was doing. When I, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what I was doing, but I didn't realize the impact it would have had on my students. And I said to them, my job, listen what I said to them. I said, they pay me. They pay me to make sure you pass this course. Alina, I see you get it. I swear to you, I had goose. I, I do it and it gave me goose from the first time a student wrote me an email and she literally said, Dr. Campbell, you made me cry. She said, I cried when I when that when, the first time I came into your class. I said to them, for those who don't know, they actually pay me so I could make sure you, are, you, you complete this course well. They didn't pay me to see who is gonna fail. Anybody get where I'm going with this conversation on a Monday evening? Nobody hired you, Alyssa, or you, Idea, or you, Alina, to say, here is your salary. Go and show me which student is gonna fail. Nobody hired you for that. They hired you to say, make sure you try all you can to ensure that these students are successful. That's what you were hired for. Somehow, many of us think we are hired to sort students who will be successful and who will be not. So I said to my students, I said to them, you are starting the course with an A+. Plus. It's up to you to maintain it or to, or to throw it away. That's what I said to them. The next side was an A+. Plus. I said, you are starting the course with an A+. Plus. Now your job is to maintain the A plus because I am about to make sure I give you what you need to get the A plus. So when I had students who were absent, I said to them, I was here waiting for you. I said, I was, I was here from six o'clock waiting for you. You didn't show up. Because the expectation I have for you, I am holding it high. High expectation I am holding for you. Let me see what's saying in the chat box. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that, Alina. I would have loved to hear that instead of, hey, guys, if you guys don't do the work, I don't care. I get paid either way. Absolutely. I hope you realize I'm stuck on this first action. Don't you worry, I'm going to go fast with the rest. Because this is the most powerful action, Alyssa. I am sick and tired of people saying, give me the equity plan. Give me the Black student success plan. You're going to see what I'm going to show you later on. We're going to work on this later on. This is the, I'm going to show you this. This is on the list to show you later on. It is a compendium. You're, you have a copy. I'm going to show you what the students have been saying from that time. From that time, what the students have been saying. You think we are all listening? You think we are listening? How will you support the black, the high expectations? Do you have, look at my last one because that's my powerhouse, Vivian. Do you have the love? compassion and empathy it requires. If I need you to succeed, I have to have certain form of love, compassion, empathy towards you. That when you need it, I am here to provide it. I didn't say I am supporting you to fail. I didn't say, sir, I am late today. Oh, it's okay, Vivian. Sir, I forget the work. Oh, it's okay, Vivian. Sir, I don't feel like working. Well, go lie down, Vivian. Sir, I'm not in the mood today. Well, don't do any work, Vivian. That's not what I'm talking about. I have heard teacher, I have heard a teacher said, well, the students are going through so much, I don't want to give them any more work to do. I go, that's not what we do for black excellence and to support it. You know, watering down the work is not supporting it. If you are supposed to give you 10 mats and I give you four, that's not supporting your excellence. I am watering it down. So here comes the next one. Identify 
and remove barriers to black students' excellence. Identify and remove barriers. Huh. Can I tell you what the student, the, 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 the research when I did that, I did the survey said, I want you to listen to me. I asked the question, what do you consider as the strongest barrier to prevent black youth success? I want you to listen to the response. I'm going to give you a chance to do this as well. I want you to listen to the response. The first response I got, the most common, was educators and administrators who do not understand how to care and incorporate Black voices. This was not my words. These are from educators like yourself. Lack of black student voice, again, here we go with voice. Status quo, lack of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy, lack of cultural understanding, lack of empathy, teacher apathy. They call out teacher apathy. This was a room full of over 70 teachers, just so you know where I got this from. Teacher apathy. I'm going to give you a, a, an, a, an, an activity to do as well for you to join so you could see and add your voice to the slides for me. Ignorant and unaware caregivers, white supremacy, microaggressions, and they list more. Lack of trust was a big one. Lack of trust was a big, big, big one. The next one I want you to understand is that see black students as individuals. This idea about all of you students, I don't know who all of you they're talking, you know. When they say all of you, I don't know who's the all of you. And you people use that term a lot. I don't know who's the all of you because I want you to understand every one of you is different. And I'm going to surprise you. If you think I think because, because we have, um, we have um, Carmen in here, or we have, let me use Alyssa and, and Shalina, and we have Nazima, and we have um, um, other black students, Sarah in here, Magna. If you think that for one minute, I see Olivia and Magna as the same, I don't. I don't. I don't see Joe and, 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 and Mike as a, Michael as the same. I don't see Gabby and Sarah as the same. There may be similarities between Cynthia and Vivian, but I don't consider you to be the same. I do not. I do not. I remember once I, I made a joke. I said, we see, our, we see black students at the university and our first assumptions is that they are there under a scholarship and they are there, you know, all that kind of stuff. I said, and that is why when we have the rich black students, they don't tell us that they are rich. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I have met rich black students. I always see. I have rich black students at our universities. They are coming from beautiful housing in where they live in, in, the, in, in the country they come from in Africa. I met one from the Congo. Three black students, they are brothers sent to university. Their fathers put them all in their beautiful apartment. They have their car, living their best lives. But they wouldn't tell you that because they realize you already assume they are, they, are, they are from Africa, they are here on a scholarship. So they don't say to you, no, we are actually quite well-to-do students. Intersectionality. So the idea to think all black students are is a part of the issue we're having. There is no all black students are. When we do not see them, we treat them with a herd mentality. What, what are the intersectionality, intersectionality? Think about that as you think about your black students and your inner city students and, and your, your, your black girls and your racialized bodies and your immigrants and, and whoever, LGBTQ, whoever, think about them. They are not all the same. The next one is establish high expectations. Establish high expectations. After doing tons and tons and tons of workshop, one day somebody said to me, Dr. Campbell, I noticed your slides. You have the best picture of black students and black people on your slide. I said, and I will not have it any other way. 
any other way. How do you demonstrate excellence? How do you demonstrate? If I was doing a, a presentation on LGBTQ students, it would have been the same, everybody. If I was doing something to do with my Asian students, it would have been the same. I do not hold and keep people in deficit. We have to establish our high expectations, right? Another one I love is hold black students to high expectations. So what do I mean by this? You know, giving them less, less math problem. We talk about that is not good. Is not, is not, is not, is not, is not the, 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 the response. What are your actions? Are you mindful of the language you use? Do we see these images? Do you know how many times I do a workshop, I do a talk to black students on black excellence. They don't get to see these pictures. These pictures are not in their books. It's not in their books. It's not on their walls. It's not in their classroom. As a teacher, make sure it's in your PowerPoint and all over your classrooms. Support, now here comes my good one. Support the high excellence. What are the resources you're bringing in? How are you adjusting the programs? How are you decolonizing your work? How are you using culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy? That's a big one everybody's talking about. If you want to do that for your final paper, go for it. If you want to do the same topic, just so you know, this topic is not off limit, you know. So if somebody in here says, Dr. Campbell, I want to take this high expectation to the next level. I am going to take this for my final paper. Go with it. Don't, and, I'm, and I mean it, and don't want to think that I, I didn't cover everything to cover. You may want to go into something else. I give you an example, Vivian. I had a student who did a whole thing about uh, an entire presentation on black girls in STEM. Her thing is black girls in STEM. And actually, just so you know, that's where I took this first, um, this first picture from with the, the black girl who was a scientist because I was looking, I was doing something with her and I was looking for black girls in STEM and I found that picture and I found a whole lot more pictures. But I want you to understand, as I want you to understand when you're going to do this kind of work, go deep, go strong. I am very, very um, intentional about that final assignment. 40%, you're not going to throw it away. I am not giving you to do foolishness. I want excellence. Support the high expectations. Support the high expectations. Mentor. Representation matters. I want you to understand that. I love this picture of black boys all in, in medical courts, a bunch of black doctors. Dr. Campbell, why, why do we need to show that? We need to show that because our students do not get to see this image of themselves. They see themselves pressed down over a police car. They see themselves under somebody's knee. They see themselves being, being, being I can't breathe. They see themselves, don't, uh, hands up, don't shoot. That's how they, we see that, that that's the most image you see of black men, black youth. For those, I think I've told the story many times before. Maybe you have heard it before because some of you have been in class with me before. I tell a story of the top picture with the Vogue. It was, it was 2020 last year. I did my first ever talk in a school in Peel, in a big, in a big secondary um, school in Peel. And I walked in, I was talking about black excellence. And one of my slides had these two pictures, but one side had these, this black, this Vogue Arabian Vogue. And I didn't know the school much. I didn't been there before. They gave me the de demographics that I know who's going to be there. Of course, I'm talking to black students. But right on about the second bench, the second row of the auditorium was about seven or eight gorgeous, fabulous Muslim hijab wearing girls. And when I was finished, they walk over to me. And I had this picture, and I had the picture of the model who made the cover of swimsuit. There's a there's a there's a there's a, um, a Muslim model who is on the cover of the 2020 swimsuit edition. Go Google it. Oh yes, fabulous. And I showed both pictures, and they walk over to me and they said, "Oh my God!" They said, "They said that was so good when we saw it and we felt." You know what? They didn't. They shouldn't have to do that. I appreciate, but I shouldn't have to do that. 
it was, they've never, and I'm going to tell you this, you might not understand the effect it had. So I'm going to explain to you for a minute. This school in Peel had one of the biggest um, screen I've ever seen. One of the biggest screen I've ever seen. The, the, it was in the auditorium, beautiful school, beautiful school. It was in the auditorium and the, they projected from the, from, the, from the back in the sky, like in the ceiling, and it was a wall. It was, the, the, the screen took up almost the entire stage. It was mega. And just seeing this slide up there in mega format, bold and beautiful did something for them. So be the change in education. I want to show you this slide, I love this slide. These are various image clusters with paths connecting. I want you to see all the parts connected in this. I want you to notice culture, teachers, technology, learning, relations, hands-on, mental health, course content, diversity, student voice, health, different from mental health, health, strong partnerships, peer support. Notice the layers here of change. Notice what you see there. Everything you see there is about growing. I love the diversity. It says, it's, I love it. It says here, diversity, under the title diversity, there is a blue and green globe. Notice it. With figure, with stick figures joining hands on top. You notice that? To the right of the globe, there is a bubble with the words support for low income families. On the left, there's a bubble that's stating diversity in teaching. And next to that, another bubble with the words knowledge about disabilities, learning mental, physical. On top of the same bubble, there are multicolored stick figures stating the following, include rural students, no age discrimination, sufficient different learning methods. I want you to understand how powerful this is when we're thinking about change in education. How are we impacting change? My final slide is what I consider to be one of my most powerful slides. I do this slide every time I do a talk on this topic because this slide is most powerful to me. I want you to understand it's a black youth, a black student there. And I want you to understand, I don't know if they're praying. Some people may say pray, that wasn't what I see. I didn't see prayer. They could not pray. I don't even care if they're praying or Christians or whatever, or Muslim or Hindu or religion. I don't even care about that. What I care about is their hands. Their hands are laid on him. Their hands, and when I see the hands, I want you to do me a favor, everybody. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write it down. So I want you to know that I'm serious about it. When you see the hands, what are the hands saying to you? My hand says, <clears throat> my, I, I, I see care. Can I ask you to type in the chat box for me? When you see the hands, what is it saying? What are the hands saying? Thank you, Madeline. It says, oh, come on now, Alicia. It says protection. It says warmth. It says I care. It says acceptance. It says support. Oh, Kai, Kai, I love this. It says connect. I'm putting a star beside that because I've never had that one before and it did something to me. It says connect. It says embrace. It says, I got your back. That's what it says. It says, I got your back. What else it says? Oh, Carmen. It says, understand. Mm. Carmen, I'm going to ask you permission to put I before understand because I want, to, I, want, I want to personalize that. I understand. Thank you for that, Carmen. Mm. Harmony. It says here. <laughs> Powerful. It says blessing as well. 
Thank you, Madeline. And ongoing support is, a, is about to do or who is about to becoming. I'm going to use the word becoming, Madeline. Madeline, it says becoming. I have support already. Anything else you can think of? Thank you for this list. I love it. I love it. It says, Cynthia, lift up. That's all you need to put. Nothing else. Nothing else to that. Lift up. Oh, come on now. You took so long to give me that, man. Joe. Joe, you took so long to give me that, Joe. And you hear how much I was crying out for that? Trust. Trust. Joe, let Andrew tell you this. Let your Dr. ABC tell you this. One of our major issues is the lack of trust. The lack of trust. I'm going to wrap up this conversation with one more slide, with one more thing. Just stay there. Give me a minute, stay right there. Let us jump back and share. I'm going to share my screen one more time. I want to share something with you all. I want to share this as we wrap up. I want to show you this as we wrap up this conversation today. And it's the Durham District School Board. You have a copy of it in your file. The Black, the Compendium for Black Action. Action. That's the word I want you to look at for Black student success. Everybody got that? You get where we're going with this conversation? I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look on this. What can educators do to support the success of black students? That way, Shalina, Shalina, I want you to realize all of this came from the students' voice. Hear what they say to us. They're saying this to me as well. Not, they're saying this to me. Change my narrative about them. <laughs> it says push academics more and sports less as a means to an end. These are what the students are saying. I don't care right now what Dr. Campbell is saying. I am telling you what the students are saying. Hire more people of color to teach, especially in our schools where people of color attend. More training in understanding who people of color are. I want you to see how powerful that slide is. The first slide, just the, the first one come from the compendium. It's not new. We have to stop behaving as if it's new. Black students have been saying this, saying this, crying out, saying this nonstop. And are we listening? Are we listening? The next one says, as a black, as a young black person, what do you see as the highest opportunities and challenges for black people your age in Durham in terms of growing up and preparing to be part of society? And it says there, we need more black role models. These are not Andrew Campbell's words. These are the words of black youth. I don't know how we are walking away, not being challenged not understanding what they're saying, not listening to them. It breaks my heart when I read these documents and I see the same thing being said over and over and over and over and over again. And we are not listening. Are we listening? There's a, smooth, there's a show that says, are we there yet? Are we listening? Are we there yet? No, we're not there. Are we listening? Are we listening? Oh, Sarah, come on now, Sarah. Come on, Sarah. I loved your statement. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for saying that. We cannot be what we cannot see. And that is why I want you all to be that example to our students. What should black, what should educators know about the experiences of black students? Something is simple down there. Black culture is very different from white culture. Very different. Are we open to the difference? And they said to us, history should not be just about slavery. Are we listening? Are we listening? I'm gonna close with that same question. 
are we listening? Are we listening? <laughs> 